All right, so we're here at the top. Uh, well, we're at the top of the hour here five minutes after. So I'll, I will get us started because the insights that Suikamara has, Dr. Rao has, are just going to be incredible. Um, so I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Sukumar Rao. He has been a dear, dear friend of ours for several years now. Um, we had the honor of, of meeting through online and then I got to spend two days um, with him as he was giving workshops in Vermont. Um, and it was one of the most transformative two days that I've ever had. Um, I got to hear him speak back to back. And um, I think about the things that Suikamar, uh, that Dr. Rao talked about almost daily. Um, so I'm, you guys are in for just an incredible treat today. Um, Suikamar, Dr. Rao has helped thousands of entrepreneurs and executives worldwide achieve at what he calls a quantum breakthrough in their personal and professional lives. Um, he shares these incredibly powerful concepts um, that allow us to, to live lives that are full of more joy, that help us find our purpose, where we leap out of bed in the morning. Um, he's got a great innovative course called Creative and Personal Mastery. Um, it was among one of the highest rated courses um, and most popular at um, one of the world's top business schools. Um, he's also a TED speaker, an elite trainer, and the author of two incredible books that you need to go read. I read them again, life-changing. Um, are You Ready to Succeed and Happiness at Work? Um, Dr. Rao, we are just absolutely honored to have you here today and um, to speak to us about a concept um, that we use every day in the EWC office to, that helps us redefine the things that happen in our lives. Um, and I am so, so humbled and honored to, to welcome you to our workshop today. Thank you, Liesl. And hello, everyone. Hello, Linda. I still remember the time that I reached out to Linda saying, isn't it a coincidence? I'm just coming to Burlington, Vermont. I know you're in Vermont, but are you close to Burlington? <laughs> and yes, <laughs> you know, Linda was, and the rest, as you say, is history. And I've always enjoyed all of the programs that I've done with uh, ever widening circles and now Conspiracy of Goodness. And uh, I have enjoyed your uh, interacting with your audience, and I'm sure that today will be no different. Uh, everything you said, by the way, about the concepts I'm going to share share are life-changing is absolutely true. But let me give your audience a little bit of background so they understand why I say that it is life-changing and it is. So I came to America as a student. I got my PhD from Columbia Business School. I went into corporate America and I was hugely successful initially. My career took off like a rocket, but I got burnt out by corporate politics. And I said, well, I have a PhD from Columbia, so let me go into academe where everybody is imbued with a quest for pure knowledge and politics does not exist. I was somewhat naive in those days. I didn't realize that politics is alive and well in universities, I found out. I think it was Henry Kissinger who said, the reason politics is so vicious in a university is because the stakes are so small. He hit the nail on the head. So I was in a university environment and equally fed up of what was going on around me, except I was making much less money and all my peers who remained in the corporate world were moving on to you know, hierarchical, uh, <coughs> in hierarchical advancement and uh, they were doing well financially and I wasn't. So I was really sorry for myself. You know, I had such a great uh, education, such a wonderful early start, and I blew it all. I wasted my life. And, uh, uh, it was like, I wasn't depressed, but I wasn't feeling on top of the world. Now, all my life, I'd been doing a lot of reading, spiritual biography, mystical autobiography, that would take me to a wonderful place. And I came back to the real world, and it sucked. And I remember thinking, if all of this is useful, only if you're sitting quietly thinking peaceful thoughts, then it's useless. But somehow I knew it was not true, that this was very valuable, maybe even the only thing that was valuable. I just hadn't figured out how to make use of it. So one day I came up with my bright idea, which is why don't I take the teachings of the world's great masters, strip them of religious, cultural, and other connotations, and adapt them so that they're acceptable to intelligent people in a post-industrial society. And the thought of doing that made me come alive. 
I was a marketing professor, right? So every time I got a bright idea, my immediate question was, will others be interested? Is there a market for it? And if I thought there was, I'd develop it. If not, I'd drop it. This is the first time I didn't ask the question. In fact, my initial thoughts were, I teach MBAs. We all know what motivates MBAs. Nobody's going to enroll for the course, but that was okay. If they did, fantastic. If they didn't, God bless them. But I was going to develop that course because I needed it for me. So I did. It did well. I moved it to Columbia Business School in 1999, and it exploded. It was the only course at Columbia, which is a university-wide draw. I had students from business school, law school, school of international public affairs, teachers college, journalism school, you name it, all over. And then students from London Business School came to Columbia on exchange. They did the program there and went back and said, this is a great crowd, of course, you have to have it. Then it traveled by word of mouth. And I've taught it at many of the world's top business schools at Columbia, London Business School, Kellogg, Berkeley, Imperial College. And now I teach it privately in New York, London, and San Francisco. The live courses are not taking place now because of the pandemic and the virtual is working so well. I don't know if I'll go back to live courses again. That's something I'll think about in the middle of next year. So that's the background. So what happens is in our top business schools, we never talk about the really important issues. Who are you? What do you stand for? What makes you happy? How do you find meaning and purpose in your life? These are not even acknowledged, much less addressed. And in my course, I used to tackle these head on. And that's why literally thousands of people will tell you this was a life transforming course. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take some of the more important concepts in my course, from my course, and I'm going to share them with your readers right now. And what I'm about to share with you, the first exercise, first concept, is something that people have told me repeatedly is one of the most important learnings they got out of my workshops, my courses, my programs, anything. Because basically it helps them to deal with adversity. Now, you and I both know that you can't go through life without having stuff happen to you. Stuff always happens to you. And this is stuff that you don't want to have happen to you. You face disappointment of various kinds. Your girlfriend walks out on you. Your boss gives you a lousy report and threatens to uh, fire you. Your uncle, your favorite uncle dies. How do you deal with all of the disasters that keep happening to you? And I'm sure that everyone listening to this can recall something going on in his life or her life that is causing him pain. So what do you do? Is life full of pain? Well, we like to think life is full of pain, but what I would like to do is give you a perspective which will enable you to become extremely resilient. Not resilient, but extremely resilient. Let me tell you the difference. Resilience is your ability to bounce back from adversity, right? And resilience is wonderful. In fact, when uh, uh, these days, when uh, uh, executives are looking to recruit people, one of the things they specifically look for is, is this person resilient? So resilience is your ability to bounce back from adversity. Extreme resilience is your ability to bounce back so quickly that an external observer might not even know that you suffered an adverse event. So resilience is great. Extreme resilience is even better because even if you're resilient, if it takes some time before you bounce back, then that's some time you spend down in the dumps and you know, it's wasted time. Why would you want to spend any time down in the dumps? Why not be up and uh, coming ready for any fate? And you can be extremely resilient. And I'm going to share with you exactly how that happens. So what I would like you to do is I would like you to think back on your life. 
Oh, before I do that, let me tell you a, a wonderful story. This story comes from uh, a Sufi tradition, and there are many versions of the story, but I like the one I'm about to share with you. There was a man and his son, and they lived harmoniously. They lived in a beautiful valley, and they had kind of an easygoing life, and they were very happy, but they were also dirt poor. So yes, they had enough to eat, but they didn't have discretionary you know, income. They didn't go on vacations. They could say, you know, I'm gonna hang out, so I'll go to Monterey and rent myself an Airbnb and simply chill out. No, none of that stuff was available. And the man eventually was glad that he was happy, but unhappy that he was poor. And he decided that he was going to become a rich man. And he decided he was going to become a rich man by breeding horses. He didn't have any money to buy a stallion. So he borrowed heavily from the neighbors and he bought a stallion. And that was going to be his passport to great wealth. Unfortunately, his paddock was in ill repair and the stallion kicked the top bar loose and jumped over and ran off. And this happened the very day he got the stallion. And all the neighbors came running around. Oh, you were going to become a rich man, but your stallion has run away. And you still owe us money. You are screwed. And the man shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? That stallion fell in with a group of wild horses and they were close to where this man lived. So he was able to use a combination of hay and alfalfa and various other feeds to lure all of the horses into his paddock, which he had repaired. So escape was now no longer possible. That meant that all of a sudden he had a stallion back plus about a dozen wild horses. And by the standards of that village, that made him a wealthy man. And the neighbors came around wondering, we thought you were destitute, but fortune has smiled upon you. You have actually become wealthy. How wonderful for you. And the man looked at them and he shrugged his shoulder and he said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? The man and his son started to break the horses so they could sell them on the market. And one of the horses threw the man's son and stomped on his leg and it broke and it healed crooked. And the neighbors came around, cluck, cluck. How sad, he was such a fine young lad, but now he's got a crooked leg, he'll never be able to find a girl to marry him, how sad. And the man shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? That summer, the king of the country declared war on a neighboring country. And after his first army got decimated, he rounded up a second army and he sent men to every village to conscript the young boys into the army. But this man's son was spared because he had a crooked leg. And the neighbors now had tears in their eyes as they rallied her. Oh, we don't know if we'll ever see our sons alive again, but you still have your son with you. How fortunate you are. And he shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? And it goes on like that forever. It's a wonderful parable. It's, you know, been... Uh, uh, told to uh, uh, for a, a lesson for centuries. And there is indeed a deep lesson embedded in that. I want you to look back on your life and recall an event that happened that at the time it happened, you thought this is terrible. But you can look back at that same event now and say, oh my God, that wasn't so terrible after all. Or even, hey, that was actually good. I've got dozens and dozens of examples, but I'll share two with you. I had someone, I was speaking to a group of uh, entrepreneurs and uh, someone said, Professor Rao, I have a perfect example for you. 
And uh, he was a tech entrepreneur and uh, he was providing very sophisticated services. And he made a bid for a client that he really wanted to uh, acquire. And uh, it came down to him and another firm. And, you know, it was a small market, so he knew the other firm well. And the other firm did something that he thought was, you know, slightly unethical. But anyway, the other firm got the contract and he did not. And, you know, he had spent a fair amount of time in that. So he was saying, Jay, I really want to get this contract because if I do, it'll enable my firm to go to the next level. And then he didn't get it. So I thought, boy, this is bad. But he forgot about it. He had taken my course. So he forgot about it and moved on. And six months later, the client was indicted for massive fraud and his competitor got stuck with several hundred thousand dollars of uncollectible receivables. They said, thank God I didn't get that contract. I'll give you another example. I was speaking before the Global Executive Summit of the Entrepreneurs Organization and somebody in the back raised his hand. I ignored him. He raised both his hands and started uh, waving them vigorously. I ignored him. And then he got up on top of his chair and started you know, waving his hands. And I couldn't ignore him anymore because everybody was looking at him. So I acknowledged him. And he also said something similar. Professor Rao, I have the perfect example for you. So he was a graduate from one of the top uh, engineering schools in India, uh, the IITs. In fact, one of the top engineering schools in the world. He came to America, he got a master's from Stanford, uh, got a job from a well-known high-tech firm and was looking forward to building his career. And his friends got jobs with other high-tech firms and they were looking forward to carrying on their friendship and growing together. But he had an immigration problem as a result of which he had to leave the country. He hired an immigration lawyer and fought it, but he didn't succeed and he had to leave. Now, among other things, he had student debt. And when you have student debt in dollars and you're earning in rupees, you're not in a very good place. So he said, you know, I thought my life was over, my career was over. But Professor Rao, as a result of my being forced out of the country, I met this wonderful lady who's now my wife. I teamed up with a couple of my engineering school buddies and we started a company and it's going gangbusters. All my clients are in America. I come to America at least six times a year. I have a picture perfect life and none of this would have happened if I hadn't been forced out. So if you look back on your life, you can recall many instances where something happened that at the time it happened, you thought this is terrible. But looking back upon it now with the perspective of time and greater wisdom, you can say that wasn't terrible or maybe even, hey, that was actually pretty good. So here is my question. Given that in your life, things happened that at the time they happened, you thought this was terrible. But later on, you can say, hey, that wasn't terrible. It was actually good. Is there any possibility that what you are today about to label bad, is there any possibility that in X years it could turn out to be wonderful? Is it possible? Just asking that question moves you to a different emotional domain. And if you then ask yourself the next question, is there anything that I can proactively do to actually make this a good thing? And all of a sudden you move seamlessly from the realm of despair to the realm of possibility. Just asking yourself, is there any possibility that what happened could turn out to be a good thing? And there are so many instances of that playing out in the world. 
take this young girl who really wanted to get an education. Unfortunately, she was in Afghanistan and because she was somewhat outspoken, she was literally shot in the face. That was a terrible thing, right? But because of that, and the publicity received by such a horrible act, she was spirited out of the country, received you know, uh, all of the medical attention that she wanted, was able to get her family out of the country, actually won a Nobel Prize, and is now a spokesperson for youth and particularly females and education and very, very, very well respected. Good thing, bad thing, who knows? Because here is something that I want you to think about. And I want everybody listening to this podcast to think about. Whenever an event occurs, any event, it does not cause suffering. Suffering begins the instant you say, this is bad, this is terrible, I cannot bear it. And the moment you stick that label, this is bad, at that instant suffering begins. Suffering doesn't begin when an, uh, when an event occurs. Suffering begins the instant you label the event, this is bad. Let's say you got fired. You now have a lot of spare time. But you say, oh my God, I got fired. How am I going to pay my rent? My children's tuition is due. This is terrible. And the moment you say this is terrible, at that instant, suffering begins. But what happens if you don't call the event terrible? Remember, good thing, bad thing, who knows? You know, this thing happened. Is it necessarily a bad thing? Is there any way in which it could actually be a good thing? And all of a sudden, you move from the realm of despair to the realm of possibility. That's how you become extremely resilient. You never have to recover from adversity because you never define anything that happens to you as, adver as adversity. You simply define it as this happened. Pema Chodron is probably the best known Buddhist uh, female Buddhist teacher. And she's written a wonderful book called When My Life Fell Apart. And she basically describes a, a time when uh, she was married and one day her husband came in and said, I'm done, and he walked out. And that's it, she was living a comfortable, you know, upper middle class existence, children, home in the, <clears throat> you know, home, good home in the suburbs, and all of a sudden it just vanished, 20 minutes. Nevertheless, it's a result of that that took her on her spiritual quest where she studied under Buddhist teachers. She's now the director of the Campo Abbey in Nova Scotia and a very, very well-respected teacher who has helped thousands, tens of thousands of people uh, come to terms with uh, the travails in their life. Lots and lots of such experiences around, lots of such examples around and in your own life. So whenever anything happens and you're about to label it, this is bad, pause and ask yourself, is this truly so? Or is there any possibility that it could in time turn out to be good? And then of course, the next question, which is even better, is there anything I can do proactively to make it a good thing? And as I said, you move. You move from despair to possibility and it happens instantaneously. And if you practice this, eventually you come to the point where you no longer have to stop to think and ask yourself, is this a, a, bad, is this a bad thing? You automatically say, you know, let's see if I can. 
And you'll find out that in the vast overwhelming majority of circumstances, even if you can't convert it into a good thing, you can simply convert it into, ah, you know, it happens, you know, that's part of life and let's go on. So it certainly can convert to a not, not a big deal status. And quite, quite often you might say, yes, it is in fact a good thing. I remember one of my students who took the course at London Business School and he joined the city of London. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, the city of London is the London equivalent of Wall Street. So he worked for a financial services firm and when the financial crisis hit, he was laid off and he was pissed off. He was more pissed off because there were some of his colleagues who he thought were really bad and they didn't get laid off, but he did. So you know, that pissed him off more than that. But he'd been through my course and he said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? I never liked the job anyway. So he uh, went on an extended vacation and then he bought a business with his severance and uh, started to make a go as an entrepreneur and it, it was just fine. But six months later, the financial crisis got worse and the entire department was disbanded. Now he was one of the earliest to get laid off. So he got a very handsome severance. The persons who were laid off later got hardly anything at all. They got a bare bones package. So it's because he was laid off early that he had the money to go on an extended vacation and to buy the business that he did. So he was actually fortunate to have been laid off and laid off early. So always ask yourself that question, good thing, bad thing, who knows? And if you do that, then you will find that nothing ever phases you because anytime something happens, you're about to label it bad, you'll remember and say, is it really bad? And I must tell you that I've run across people who've taken my course two decades or more ago and they came back and said, Professor Rao, I can't tell you how many times good thing, bad thing has saved my bacon. Occasionally, somebody comes up and says, Professor Rao, you only addressed one half of that. What about the other half? You know, should I worry if a good thing happens to me? I say, by and large, what happens is we use the bad thing label and get bent out of shape at bad things happening to us so often that you can relate to it. So that lesson holds. But actually there's also a lesson in the good thing uh, side of the equation as well. Like say, for example, I had some students of my class who uh, <clears throat> graduates from my uh, course who got a job with this very innovative company, very prestigious. Everybody wanted to get a job with this company. It was the cutting edge of uh, management and financial thinking. And a few weeks after they joined it, the company filed for bankruptcy. We're talking about Enron. And all of a sudden, instead of having a job with the prestigious company, they had a job with a company which was bankrupt, laying people off and indicted for massive fraud. There is a lesson in there to you. When something good happens, do not get elated. Do not go over the top. Recognize that it happened, appreciate it, and be grateful for it. That's another concept that I want to share. But do not go over the moon. Simply say, okay, good thing happened. What can I do to continue the trajectory of goodness and see that it doesn't come unstuck? But in your mind, always remember good thing, bad thing, who, who knows? You're going to enjoy it. You're going to enjoy it guardedly, but you'll be fully prepared for it to come unstuck. And if it does come unstuck, it won't be a bad thing. It will simply be a, this happened, where do I go from here? And when you do that, you'll find that your life goes to a higher trajectory where you are calm, where you feel genuine well-being in your life and most, most important, joy coming into your life. Let me share one more concept, and then we'll take it on to uh, questions. I said that when something good happens in your life, be grateful. And there's a reason for that. 
Our awareness is like a flashlight. That's important for everyone to know. What does a flashlight do? A flashlight illuminates whatever you shine it on. Shine it on the floor, it lights up the floor. Shine it on the ceiling, the ceiling is lit up. What do we do with our flashlight of awareness? We shine it on the two, three, or four things that are wrong in our lives, that we think are a problem in our lives. Not on the problems in our lives, but the things that we think are problems in our lives. It's not the same thing. And what about the 40, 50, 60, 200 things which are pretty damn good about our lives? We don't shine the flashlight of our awareness on them, so they go by unnoticed. Like, look, do you have food to eat? Do you have to bother about lunch or dinner? Do you have a bed to sleep in? Do you have a roof over your head? Any of these is a big deal in a big chunk of the world, right? Just read about what's happening to the migrant population uh, outside uh, Belarus right now. So when I point that out, you say, yes, yes, I am privileged. But the point is you don't feel privileged. You feel put upon and stressed out. And why is that? It's because of where you shine the flashlight of your awareness on. You do not shine the flashlight of your awareness on the many ways in which you're truly blessed and therefore all that goes under the radar unobserved. This is a powerful concept and I'm going to prove it to you right now. I want you to take the flashlight of your awareness and shine it on the chair in which you are sitting. And the moment you do that, you become aware of the pressure of your buttocks on the seat. You feel the fabric or the leather pressing against the back of your thigh. Yes. 30 seconds ago, you were not aware of any of that, but now you are. That's because you've shown the flashlight of your awareness on it. So make it a point to shine the flashlight of your awareness on the many things in your good in your life and the many ways in which you're truly blessed. I would ad advocate doing this last thing at bed, last thing at night before you go to bed. When you get up in the morning, don't go immediately to the space of, oh my God, there's too much to do and I don't have enough time to do it all. Shine the flashlight of your awareness, the good things in your life. Let that feeling of awareness, the feeling of gratitude well up within you. This is an experiential exercise, not a thinking exercise. So it's not much good thinking gratitude. You have to consistently practice it for a while before you actually feel it rather than think it. As you go through the day, constantly bring up this feeling of gratitude. And it is my hope that eventually everyone will be in the default emotional domain of appreciation and gratitude. And why is this important? This is important because when you're in the default emotional domain of appreciation and gratitude, you're not angry, you're not fearful, you're not anxious, you're not worried. The two cannot coexist. So when you're practicing the good thing, bad thing exercise, and you're asking yourself, could this possibly in X years turn out to be good? And you also mix that with gratitude and shine the flashlight of your awareness on the ways in which this could turn out to be fantastic. And then you work towards it. You will find that every day becomes a blast. That's how you eliminate stress in your life. That's how you become extremely resilient. And that's how you bring joy into your life. And having said that, I have taken up more than my time. So I apologize, but I do have time for questions. So Liesl or Linda, can you look up the I, chat box and tell me if there are any yeah. questions? Yes. Well, firstly, thank you so much to Kumar. Um, this last piece about gratitude has been uh, is super, super personally just a, a wonderful moment. And I want to, I want to thank you for bringing that up. I, I think I've heard you talk, say that before, but it's never struck me quite like this. So I want to extend a personal thank you to you for, for that. Thank you. Um, I, um, so please throw some questions in the chat if you have any for, for Dr. Rao. Um, but I can, I'll start off. Um, do you have, I'm one of those people that's a former athlete. So I, I like a good practice kind of exercise session. And I was wondering if you have any 
sort of suggested either daily practices or reflection practices that we can incorporate into our life to start flexing that that good thing, bad thing, um, and the gratitude muscle um, so that we kind of make more intentional time for it. So it be, does become our, our reaction. If you've got any kind of like quick practices, because yes. I'm definitely someone who- I do have an exercise. Negative. And actually this is an exercise, which is the very first exercise that somebody, uh, I said somebody who takes my program or who comes into a coaching relationship with. I'm also a coach, by the way, I coach entrepreneurs and senior executives. And that is to watch your mental chatter. Your mental chatter is the internal monologue that you have going on in your head all the time. Oh my God, what do I have to do? I'm so tired. You know, all of that is mental chatter. If you observe your mental chatter, you'll find that it's taking you to all kinds of places you don't go. Now understand that mental chatter is neither good nor bad, it just is. Our problems do not arise because of mental chatter. Our problems arise because we identify with our mental chatter. Mm -hmm. And when you identify with the mental chatter, then it can take you to all kinds of places and some of them are very dark. But if you don't identify with your mental chatter, but simply observe it, hey, there's a movie going on. Hey, there's my mental chatter. It's telling me I'm having too much pizza. It's telling me I'm fat. Hey, hey isn't it a fun? So you don't identify with your mental chatter, you observe your mental chatter, and when you do, you'll find that it runs out of steam very, very, very fast. And when you do that, Lisa, you'll also find that your mental chatter can no longer prevent you from doing things you want to or force you to do things that you don't want to. Mm -hmm. You get up in the morning and you don't want to practice. That's your mental chatter saying, where do you want to get up? You know, it's better to spend another 10 minutes of sleep, pull the cover on, 10 minutes, doesn't matter. And you can observe it's the mental chatter. And it's get up, you put, put on your sneakers and you go exercise or whatever you said, said you're going to do. So observing your mental chatter and becoming aware is a fundamental foundation exercise. And in my course, I have persons do it intensively for a week. But though you do it intensively for a week, that's just scratching the surface. This is a rest of your life exercise. Because mental chatter is a cunning animal and you'll be surprised at how many ways it insinuates itself into you with the objective of getting you to identify and engage with it. Mm. That's that's brilliant. I love that. Again, another concept. I'm writing these down as fast as I can. I'm running out of space. Um, Linda asks, um, do you have any uh, tips on steering a moment of increasing drama in a better direction with the good thing, bad thing concept? So in the context of outside of myself, how do I help others through it? Get them to see one of the unfortunate things about the, about the world we live in is we have a media that's very largely driven by profit considerations. And people are much more drawn to negative emotions than to the calmness and serenity of true joy. So look at the headlines of any paper Look at the opening uh, five minutes of any news broadcast, and there's always doom and gloom. And in America, you have these newscasters who are speaking with a grave voice as to, you know, here's all. But actually, they're celebrating it internally because doom and gloom get eyeballs, they get attention, which means uh, uh, advertising revenue. So they are upending society, literally, and fostering, you know, uh, divisions, fostering hate, literally. You know, yay, let's go up, let's kill them. You know, all this partisan feeling. Maybe it's okay if you're watching a sporting event and even there I have questions, but it's not okay when you're actually referring to people who are part of your country 
And you're dividing every which way you can by race, by ethnicity, by religion, by occupation, by income, you name it. So when all of this is happening, it is incumbent upon you, first of all, to recognize what is happening. And every time you watch a television program, every time you watch a you know, television personality or a newscaster, ask yourself, what is the space this person is taking me to? Do I want to spend time in that space? Does it make me feel good? Is it true to my values? Would I like to spend time there? And if you sincerely ask yourself that question, you'll notice that there is a change. There is a change in the books you read, the movies you watch, the friends you hang out with, the topics of conversation you bring up with the friends you hang up with, all of that changes. And it changes if you ask yourself a very simple question. Where is this taking me? Do I want to spend time there? And sincerely ask yourself that question. Mm. Which is one of the reasons I absolutely like whatever Whitening Circle is doing, because you're trying to get people to go. But at the same time, you will discover how much tougher it is to do what you're doing than tell them, oh, no, you know, there is this guy. You take a machine gun and you kill 17 other. And everybody wants to know more about that. Mm -hmm. Linda? Yeah, I, Lynn. Oh, sorry. I was going to bring I, I more definitely want to get to Lynn. Oh, okay. Sorry. I definitely want to get to Lynn, but I just want to say, you know, um, as a little tip that Sweekumar taught me a long time ago, I just say, when something creeps up, I just say, this happened. Yep. And that's the farthest I let anything go in my, my mind. My mom passed away this weekend and I was at a meeting with my very emotional brother yesterday and they got the time for the funeral wrong in the obituary. So three hours earlier, now we're telling people to come to the funeral and I could see my brother's blood pressure going up in front of this poor pastor. And I said, I thought of you, Dr. Rao, I said, this happened and that's it. I didn't make it good thing or bad thing. And I got to tell you, it made all the difference in, in the world, in the emotion in that room and what came next. So I really, really encourage people to, to try all this that Dr. Rao is sharing with us. If you can just say this happened and not let it go any further in some really difficult moments, you can be the one who turns and shifts the moment. So thank, thank you. you, Linda, and condolence, profound condolences for you all. Um, so Lynn asks, and I, that's, that's such a good one, and I think in practice in one of the most difficult times as well. Um, so Lynn asks, and I think this is a really interesting one. So Lynn says, I'm putting together my notes, and um, that when we feel good, not to get too excited, because that might that that might unstick sooner into what we might label uh, uh, sooner into what we might label uh, bad. Is the goal calm or every day a blast? Is it a blast because we're not attached to labels in our experiences? Um, I thought that extremes are good. The deeper the despair, the stronger the joy. Can you talk a little bit more about that kind of how Absolutely. we balance that? I get that all the time. Professor Rao, you know, if we do that, then our lives are kind of blah and boring and nothing happens. And I want to feel, I want to feel the achievement and I want to feel the despair and the heartbreak. And if that's where you are and that's what you want, by all means. But eventually you'll recognize that all of these things that you're talking about are very transient and in the feeling of the immense elation and the despair and the depression, you'll find that you're just getting worn out passing through these sinusoidal cycles of elation and despair. And generally you tend to spend more time at the despair end of the spectrum. So when you get to the point that you say, hey, this is not where it's at, that's when you start paying attention because if you're in the model, oh, I want to feed all of this and that's life, what life is about. Hey, that's fine. Good luck to you. When you get tired of that, then go back and listen to what I just shared. That's one. And the second thing is every day is a blast, but a blast should not be confused with 
overpowering emotion, either uh, elation or despair. You'll find as you go through this that there is a quiet calmness in your emotional domain. And when you discover that calmness, you also discover a deep joy, a rooted sense of well being, which is not there when you're passing through these cycles of elation and uh, despair. That's what I mean by every day is a blast because there is a serene joyousness in your life, the knowledge that there is meaning and purpose and doing exact, you're doing exactly what you put on this earth to do. Mm. I love that, I love that so much. Um, one last question here, um, Dr. Rao. Um, Bryce asked, Dr. Rao mentioned that after asking ourselves, is there a chance this could turn out to be a good thing? We should follow that up by asking ourselves, is there anything I can actively do to make this a good thing? Um, do you have any strategies or tips on how to actively make uh, this a good thing? Um, or could you just elaborate on, on that point a little bit more? Oh, absolutely. In other words, what happens is, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example that will happen. So there was uh, uh, somebody who was uh, a salesperson in a financial services firm, and he had spent months working on a case which would have given him a very, very, very large commission. And at the last minute, the client decided, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it. So quite literally, you know, a many, many hours and many months of hard work went down the tubes. So, you know, initially he was despondent. He thought, hey, maybe I should, you know, leave the company. This is not for me, et cetera, et cetera. Went down and over. And uh, he had, however, taken my course. He bounced back and said, okay, I lost this. So is there any way? in which uh, it could actually become a good thing. And uh, he thought about it and said, and what happened is, by the way, that uh, he was new. And because he was new, but nevertheless, he was very, uh, you know, very charismatic individual, you know, very well-spoken. Uh, the company had asked him to speak to other new hires who were his peers about, you know, what's it like working for the company. So at the next speech, he gave this as an example as this happened. And I was so devastated, you know, out. And he used that as an example to tell people that things like this happen in the company and you shouldn't let it get you down. So, you know, what's not another of the lessons that I shared, which is invest in the process, not the outcome. But that resonated so well with people. Here's this guy talking about a real case and he could have made so much money and he didn't make the money and it didn't break him up. And that talk turned out to be so successful that the company you know, paid him to deliver more such talks throughout their entire uh, 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 field force. So it, it, because of that, you know, it, it launched up an alternate uh, field of inquiry, uh, <coughs> field of earnings for him something that he never expected, but he was able to make use of it. You never know how things work out. Your job is to don't label it bad, label it this happened and say, how can I leverage this? And when you do that and you're not desperate to escape a bad thing that happened, the universe opens up in ways that you cannot even foresee. Could this person have foreseen that that losing of you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in premiums could open up an entirely different career? Be open to what the universe provides you. I think that's a, a wonderful sentiment to, to close on today. Sukumar, Dr. Rao, sorry. I know, <laughs> Dr. Rao, thank you so, so much for joining us. My pleasure, Tali, um, and I wish you every success with what you're doing. We need you to be multiplied by a couple of thousand because that's exactly what the world needs today. We don't need what is coming to us electronically. We need what you're deliberately <laughs> curating. Have a super oh, thank day. you. Bye. Thank you, thank you. Thank Bye. you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we will put um, links to Dr. Rao's work in the... Um, in the chat, um, we'll also be um, posting it on our um, 
on the platform on the Conspiracy of Goodness Network, so you can come back and revisit all the insights uh, from uh, today's talk.